From New York and Glasgow, this is Democracy Now! The U.S. Department of Defense has a larger annual carbon footprint than most countries on Earth, and it also is the single largest polluter on Earth. Today, we look at the seldom discussed link between U.S. militarism and the climate crisis. The U.S. military is one of the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters and the world's biggest consumer of oil. But military emissions have been exempted from international climate treaties for decades. We'll speak to two U.S. veterans. It is absolutely imperative that we include U.S. military emissions in the overall accounting of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere, even if it is politically inconvenient to do so. Plus, we speak to Stella Morris, the partner of Julian Assange. She is in Glasgow highlighting WikiLeaks' role in exposing the hypocrisy of wealthy nations in addressing the climate crisis. Julian should never be extradited because he was doing his job as a journalist. He's being criminalized as a journalist. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Negotiators at a crucial United Nations climate summit in Glasgow, Scotland, have released a first draft of the COP26 final decision text. It's being blasted by environmentalists as exceptionally weak. Greenpeace noted the 850-word document fails to acknowledge that fossil fuels are driving the climate crisis, while making no commitment to tangible actions to end global reliance on coal, oil and gas. The draft text release came as former President Barack Obama traveled to Glasgow, where he called on world leaders to step up their actions to avert climate disaster while blasting China and Russia for hindering progress on the climate emergency. Mitzi Tan, a youth climate activist from the Philippines, said Obama's words ring hollow. The U.S. is the country that is historically most responsible for the climate crisis, and yet they have barely done anything. They have promised so much, they have pledged so much, but they're still not doing enough. Even their pledges, which they don't even have actual milestones to get to and plans to get to, aren't enough considering the amount of emissions, amount of pollution, amount of injustices that they have done to the rest of the world. To see Democracy Now!'s extended interview with Mitzi Tan, go to democracynow.org. This comes as a Washington Post investigation found most countries' pledges to reduce greenhouse gas emissions are built on flawed data. The Post examined 196 country reports and found a giant gap between what nations declare their emissions to be versus the greenhouse gases they're actually sending into the atmosphere. Elsewhere in Glasgow, police reportedly used a battering ram early Monday morning to break into a disused former homeless shelter that had been converted into temporary squat for climate activists. Witnesses described Metropolitan Police and Welsh forces going from room to room with batons drawn. The officers' conduct reportedly shocked Scottish police, who arrived on the scene soon after the raid. Activists say they've since re Open this space. After headlines, we'll go to Glasgow for the latest on the COP26 climate summit. COVID-19 cases continue to surge to record highs in many parts of Europe. Germany is averaging more than 28,000 daily infections, its worst case rate of the pandemic. Austria has ordered unvaccinated people to keep out of cafes, barbershops and other public spaces as cases expand exponentially. Russians returned to workplaces around the country Monday after a mandatory nine-day break ordered by President Putin. It's not clear whether the move will flatten Russia's COVID-19 curve. Today, Russia reported another record daily toll of more than 1,200 deaths in just 24 hours. In the United States, coronavirus cases have leveled off, with an average of more than 72,000 daily infections. However, the number of hospitalized patients is continuing a slow decline. More than 1,200 U.S. residents a day are dying of COVID-19, the vast majority of them unvaccinated. 
the U.S.-Mexico border reopened Monday for non-essential travelers with visas who are fully vaccinated, allowing many binational families and loved ones to reunite for the first time since COVID-19 restrictions were enacted over a year and a half ago. This is a resident of Juarez across the border from El Paso, Texas. It really is a very special day because everyone who lives near the border knows we are like one big city. The way we live and get along is unique, and that's why today is special. Because a lot of people spent the last 20 months without seeing each other, without visiting, today is a celebration for us. Loved ones also celebrated reunions at U.S. airports as restrictions were lifted for fully vaccinated international travelers into the United States. This comes as immigrant justice advocates reported that while the U.S. lifted its restrictions for non-essential travelers, Customs and Border Protection agents at U.S. ports of entry across the southern border are still blocking asylum seekers from entering the U.S., including unaccompanied children. In related news, the Biden administration is launching an operation this week to start deportation proceedings for some 78,000 migrants who crossed into the U.S. this year but were not immediately expelled or taken to an immigration jail. In Europe. The Polish government has deployed thousands more soldiers and riot police to its eastern border with Belarus as it intensifies its violent crackdown on migrants and refugees, mostly from the Middle East and Africa, who are fleeing violence, poverty and the impacts of the climate catastrophe. One Kurdish refugee from Syria who gained asylum in Austria traveled to the border to help his parents try to cross into Poland from Belarus. First of all, I'm not helping just any old person. I'm helping my parents. I think in the laws of all countries, of all regions, it is not forbidden for a person to help their parents. Second of all, the people there, aside from my parents, they're also human beings. They need help. In Nicaragua, President Daniel Ortega has declared victory and will be serving a fourth term after winning Sunday's election by a landslide. The United States, European Union and others quickly announced they will not recognize the election results, denounced by opponents as illegitimate, after Ortega's government jailed at least seven presidential hopefuls, accusing them of being U.S. allies. Ortega, alongside Vice President and First Lady Rosario Murillo, celebrated their re-election Monday in Managua's Revolution Plaza. Ortega blasted the U.S. government for supporting a coup attempt in 2018 and for continuing to interfere in Nicaragua. Many have also denounced ongoing and crippling U.S. sanctions on Nicaragua. Mobile phones belonging to at least six Palestinian human rights activists were hacked with the Israeli firm NSO Group's Pegasus spyware. The findings were published in a joint report by Amnesty International, Frontline Defenders and the University of Toronto's Citizen Lab. Those hacked include workers with Palestinian nonprofits that were designated terrorist groups by Israel last month. In related news, a U.S. appeals court is allowing WhatsApp messaging service to move forward with a lawsuit against NSO Group over allegedly targeting some of its servers in California to infect about 1,400 mobile devices with malware, a violation of state and federal law. This comes as Israel's lobbying the U.S. government to remove the NSO group from a trade blacklist, arguing its software is crucial to Israel's foreign policy. The NSO group's Pegasus spyware has been used by governments to target hundreds of activists, journalists and government officials. The U.S. government the U.S. Justice Department said Monday it has indicted two hackers behind major ransomware attacks in the U.S. and has recovered more than $6 million in cryptocurrency payments. Attorney General Merrick Garland said one of the two men, a Russian hacker with the R. Evil ransomware gang, remained at large, while a Ukrainian co-conspirator had been arrested in Poland and would be extradited to the U.S. for trial. Garland said the criminal gang's ransomware has infected over over 175,000 computers worldwide, with at least $200 million paid in ransom. An alleged capital rioter wanted by the FBI is seeking political asylum in Belarus. Evan Newman's wanted for violent entry, disorderly conduct, assaulting and resisting law enforcement. On Monday, Newman appeared on a Belarusian t state TV segment titled Goodbye America. 
Meanwhile, a House panel investigating the January 6th insurrection has subpoenaed six allies of former President Trump, including his disgraced former national security adviser Michael Flynn. Lawmakers want details on how the allies' false claims of voter fraud whipped up the pro-Trump mob that attacked the Capitol. In the days before the riot, Michael Flynn publicly called for a military coup to overthrow the U.S. government and, during an Oval Office meeting, discussed seizing voting machines and invoking a national emergency. On Friday, President Trump's former acting assistant attorney general at the time of the insurrection, Jeffrey Clark, refused to testify to congressional investigators, though he did show up, citing Trump's claims of executive privilege. In response, January 6 committee chair Benny Thompson said he was weighing criminal contempt charges for Clark. Clark was a key player in Trump's efforts to enlist the Justice Department to sow doubt over results of the presidential election in Georgia. And the Supreme Court heard oral arguments on Monday in a case that will determine whether three Muslim men from California can sue the FBI for illegally spying on them after the 9-11 attacks. Lawyers for the Bureau argue the suit should be dismissed under the state secrets privilege. In 2006 and 7, the FBI recruited a man named Craig Montiel to pose as a Muslim convert in order to infiltrate mosques and Islamic groups around Orange County, where he seeks secretly recorded conversations. The former imam at one mosque, Sheikh Yasser Fazaga, who is now lead plaintiff in the lawsuit, says Montiel planted a recording device in his office. And to me, that's a very, very sensitive area. I am a therapist where people come in and they share their issues with me. But to know that the FBI potentially was recording these sessions that is illegal, it is unethical, it is not constitutional, and it puts a lot of people's lives in, in jeopardy and, and their well-being and, and their rights of privacy. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we look at the seldom-discussed link between U.S. militarism and the climate crisis. The U.S. military is a larger polluter than 140 countries, but military emissions have been exempted from international climate treaties for decades. We'll speak to war veterans. Stay with us. On Planet Earth by Jamiroquai. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting from Glasgow, New York, and New Jersey. I'm Amy Goodman, joined by Democracy Now! co host Juan Gonzalez. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, former U.S. President Barack Obama addressed the U.N. Climate Summit Monday, criticizing the leaders of China and Russia for not attending the talks in Glasgow. Most nations have failed to be as ambitious as they need to be. The escalation, the ratcheting up of ambition that we anticipated in Paris six years ago has not been uniformly realized. I have to confess, it was particularly discouraging to see the leaders of two of the world's largest emitters, China and Russia, decline to even attend the proceedings. 
and their national plans so far reflect what appears to be a dangerous lack of urgency, a willingness to maintain the status quo uh, on the part of those governments. And that's a shame. While Obama singled out China and Russia, climate justice activists openly criticized President Obama for failing to deliver on climate pledges he made as president or for his role in overseeing the world's largest military. This is Filipina activist Mitzi Tan. I definitely think that President Obama is a disappointment because he lauded himself as the black president who cared about the people of color. But if he did, he wouldn't have failed us. He wouldn't have let this happen. He wouldn't have killed people with drone strikes. And, and that is connected to the climate crisis because the U.S. military is one of the biggest polluters and causing the climate crisis also. And so there's so many things that President Obama in the U.S. has to do in order to really claim that they are the climate leaders that they're saying they are. Speakers at last week's large Fridays for Future rally in Glasgow also called out the U.S. military's role in the climate emergency. My name is Aisha Siddiqa. I come from northern region of Pakistan. The U.S. Department of Defense has a larger annual carbon footprint than most countries on Earth, and it also is the single largest polluter on Earth. Its military presence in my region has cost the United States over $8 trillion since 1976. It has contributed to the destruction of environments in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, the greater Persian Gulf, and Pakistan. Not only have Western-induced wars led to spikes in the carbon emissions, um, they have led to use of de depleted uranium, and they have caused poisoning of air and water, and have led to birth defects, cancer, and suffering of thousands of people. The Costs of War Project estimates the U.S. military produced around 1.2 billion tons of carbon emissions between 2001 and 2017, with nearly a third coming from U.S. wars overseas, including in Afghanistan and Iraq. But one, by one account, the U.S. military is a larger polluter than 140 countries combined, including numerous industrialized nations such as Sweden, Denmark and Portugal. However, military carbon emissions have largely been exempted from international climate treaties dating back to the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, thanks to lobbying from the United States. At the time, a group of neoconservatives, including future vice president and then Halliburton CEO Dick Cheney, argued in favor exempting all military emissions. On Monday, a group of climate activists staged a protest outside the COPS, spotlighting the role of the U.S. military in the climate crisis. We're joined now by three guests. Inside the U.N. Climate Summit, Ramon Mejia joins us, the anti-militarism national organizer of Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. He's an Iraq war vet. We're also joined by Eric Edstrom, who fought in the Afghan war and later studied climate change at Oxford. He's the author of Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. He's joining us from Boston. Also with us in Glasgow— is Nita Crawford. She's with the Costs of War Project at Brown University. She's a professor at Boston University. She's just outside the COP. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Ramon Mejia, let's begin with you. You participated in protests inside the COP and outside the COP. How did you go from being an Iraq War veteran to a climate justice activist? Thank you for having me, Amy. Um, I participated in the invasion of Iraq in 2003. As part of that invasion, which was a crime, I was able to witness the sheer destruction of Iraqi's infrastructure, of its uh, water treatment plants, of uh, sewage. And um, it was something that I couldn't live with myself and I couldn't uh, continue to support. So after leaving the military, I had to speak up and to um, uh, oppose U.S. militarism in every shape, way, or form that it shows up in our communities. Um, in Iraq alone, uh, the, the Iraqi people have, uh, uh, have been researched and, and said that they are, uh, um, have 
the worst uh, 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 genetic damage uh, that has ever been studied um, or researched. Um, so it is my uh, um, obligation as a, as a war veteran to speak out against wars um, and especially um, how wars impact not only our people, uh, the environment and the climate. And Ramon Mejia, what about this issue of the role of the U.S. military uh, in fossil fuel emissions? Uh, the uh, When you were in the military, was there any sense among your fellow uh, GIs about the situation, uh, about this enormous uh, uh, pollution that the, the military is visiting on the planet? Um, when I was in the military, there wasn't any discussion about the chaos that we were creating. Um, I conducted resupply convoys throughout the country, delivering munitions, delivering tanks, delivering uh, uh, repair parts. And in that process, I saw uh, nothing but waste being uh, left. Um, you know, even our own units were burying munitions and, and disposable uh, 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 trash into, you know, into the middle of the desert. We were burning trash, creating toxic fumes that have impacted veterans. Uh, but. Uh, not only veterans, but the Iraqi people and those adjacent to those toxic burn pits. So the U.S. military, um, why emissions is important to discuss, and it's important that within these climate conversations that we address how the militaries are excluded and uh, don't have to reduce or report emissions, we also have to discuss uh, the violence that the militaries wage on our communities, um, on the climate, uh, on the environment. You know, we came with a delegation, a frontline delegation of over 60 grassroots leaders um, um, under the banner of It Takes Roots uh, from Indigenous Environmental Network, from Climate Justice Alliance, from Just uh, Transition Alliance, from Jobs with Justice. And we came here to say that uh, no net zero, uh, no war, no warming, keep it in the ground. Uh, because many of our community members have experienced uh, what the military has, uh, has to offer. Uh, one of our delegates from New Mexico, from the Southwest, uh, work, uh, Southwest Organizing Project, spoke to how millions and millions of, of, of jet fuel have spilled in, uh, in Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, more fuel has spilled and leached into the aquifers of neighboring communities than the Axon Valdez, and yet those conversations aren't being had. Uh, and we have another delegate from Puerto Rico and Vieques, how uh, munitions tests and chemical weapons tests have, uh, have plagued the island. And while the U.S. Navy is no longer there, cancer still um, is stricken the population. And uh, the group Global Witness uh, uh, has estimated that there are over 100 coal, oil, and gas company lobbyists and their associated groups uh, at COP26. What do, what's your sense of the impact of the fossil fuel lobby uh, uh, at this at uh, at this gathering, um, there can be any genuine discussion about addressing climate change, and if we're not uh, in, including the, the the military, the military, as we know, is the largest consumer of fossil fuels and also the largest emitter of of greenhouse gases, most responsible for the climate disruption. So when you have uh, fossil fuel industries that are that have a larger delegation than most of our frontline communities and the global south then then we're being silenced this space is not a space for genuine discussions um, it's a discussion for transnational corporations and, and industry and and, uh, and polluting governments to continue to try and find ways um, to uh, to go as business as usual without uh, w without actually addressing the roots of, uh, of, the, of the conversation. Uh, you know, this, this COP has been dubbed uh, net zero, uh, the COP of net zero, but um, this is just a false unicorn. It's a false solution just the same way as uh, greeting the military is. You know, emissions is important that we discuss it, but greeting the military is also not the solution. We have to address that the violence uh, that the military wages and the, dis and the, and the, and the catastrophic effects it has on our world. Um, so, the conversations within the COP aren't genuine um, because we can't even we can't even uh, hold pointed conversations and hold those accountable. We have to speak in generalities. You know, we can't say U.S. military. We have to say military. Uh, we can't say uh, uh, that uh, that the, our government is the one that's most responsible for pollution. We have to speak in generality. So when there is this unlevel playing field, then we know that the discussions aren't genuine here. The, the, the genuine discussions and the real change is happening in the streets with our communities and our international movements that are here to not only discuss but apply pressure. Uh, this 
you know, what is it? Uh, uh, we've been calling it the the uh, the, the cop is the is a uh, you know profiteers is the convening of profiteers. That's what that's what that's what it is, and um, we're here not to concede uh, the space uh, in which power resides. We're here to apply pressure, and we're also here to speak on behalf of our international comrades and movements from around the world that aren't able to come uh, to this uh, uh, to, to Glasgow because of uh, vaccine apartheid and the restrictions that they have on uh, coming to, uh, to to discuss what's happening in their community. So we're here to uplift their voices and to continue to speak on and uh, uh, in, 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 you know with them. Uh, on what's happening around the world. In addition to Ramon Mejia, we're joined by yet another uh, Marine Corps vet, and he is Eric Edstrom, Afghan war vet, uh, went on to study climate at Oxford and write the book Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. Um, if you can talk about, well, I ask you the same question as I asked Ramon. Here you were, a Marine Corps veteran, how you went from that to a climate activist and what we should understand about the costs of war at home and abroad. You fought in Afghanistan. Thank you, Amy. Yes, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't make a brief correction, which is I'm an army officer or a former army officer and uh, don't want to take heat from my fellow colleagues for being misconstrued as a, a marine officer. But the, the journey to climate activism, uh, I think, started when I was in Afghanistan and realized that we were solving the wrong problem the wrong way. Uh, we're missing the upstream issues underpinning uh, foreign policy around the world, which is the disruption caused by climate change which endangers other communities, it creates geopolitical risk. And to be focusing on Afghanistan, effectively playing Taliban whack-a-mole while ignoring the climate crisis seemed like a terrible use of priorities. Uh, so immediately, you know, when I was done with my military service, wanted to study what I believe is the most important issue facing this generation. And today, when reflecting upon military emissions in the overall accounting globally, it's not only intellectually dishonest to exclude them, it is irresponsible and dangerous. And Eric, uh, I'd like to ask you about the relationship between oil and the military, uh, the U.S. military, but also other imperial militaries uh, around the world. Uh, there's historically been a relationship of military seeking to control oil resources in times of war, uh, as well as being the prime users uh, of these oil resources to b build up their military capacity, hasn't there? Uh, there has been. Uh, I, I think that uh, Amy did a fantastic job laying out, and, and so did the other speaker, around the military being the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels in the world. And I think that that definitely drives some of the decision making in the military. Uh, the emissions attributable to the U.S. military is more than civilian aviation and shipping combined. But one of the things I really wanted to drive home in this conversation is around something that's not discussed very much in the, the costs of war, which is the social cost of carbon or the negative externalities associated uh, with our global boot print as a military around the world. And Amy was right to point out that uh, citing the Brown University Watson Institute and the 1.2 billion metric tons of estimated emissions from the military during the time of the global war on terror. And when you look at public health studies that start to do the calculus to say, how many tons must you emit in order to harm somebody elsewhere in the world? It's about 4,400 tons. So if you do the simple arithmetic, the global war on terror has potentially caused up to 270,000 climate related deaths around the globe, which further heightens and exacerbates an already high cost of war and strategically undermines the very objectives that the military is hoping to achieve, which is stability. And morally, it is also further undermining the very mission statement and the oath of the military, which is to protect Americans and be a global force for good, if you take a globalized uh, or a globalization pr perspective. So, Undermining uh, the, the climate crisis and turbocharging it is not the role of the military, and we need to apply additional pressure for them to both disclose 
and reduce its massive carbon footprint. To put Juan's more eloquent question um, into, I remember this sad joke uh, with the U.S. invasion of Iraq, a little boy saying to his father, what's our oil doing under their sand? Um, uh, I was wondering if you can elaborate more, Eric Edstrom, on um, what constitutes military emissions and what does the Pentagon understand? I mean, for years, when we were covering the Bush wars under George W. Bush, um, there was the uh, we would always cite that they're not talking about their own Pentagon studies saying climate change is the critical issue of the 21st century. But what do they understand both overall about the issue and the role of the Pentagon uh, in polluting the world? I mean, I think that probably at the senior levels of brass within the military, there is understanding that climate change is a real and existential threat. Um, there's a disconnect, though, which is a point of tension, which is what is the military going to do specifically about it, and specifically its own emissions. Uh, if the military were to disclose its full carbon footprint and to do so on a regular basis, that number would be deeply embarrassing and create uh, a tremendous amount of political pressure on the U.S. military to reduce those emissions going forward. So that you could understand their reluctance, but nonetheless, we should absolutely count military emissions because it does not matter what the source is. If it comes from a civilian aircraft or a military aircraft to the climate itself, it does not matter. And we must count every ton of emissions, irrespective of whether it is politically inconvenient to do so. And without the disclosure, we are running blind. To prioritize decarbonization efforts, we need to know the sources and volume of those military emissions so that our leaders and politicians can make informed decisions about which sources they might want to shut down first. Is it overseas bases? Is it a, a certain vehicle platform? Those decisions will not be known, and we cannot make smart choices intellectually and strategically until those numbers come out. A new research from Brown University's Cost of War project shows that the Department of Homeland Security has been overly focused on foreign and foreign-inspired terrorism, while violent attacks in the U.S. have more often come from domestic sources, uh, you know, talking about white supremacy, for example. Uh, Nita Crawford is with us. She's just outside the COP right now, the U.N. summit. She's the co-founder and director of the Cost of War project at Brown. Uh, she's a professor and department chair of political science at Boston University. Professor Crawford, we welcome you back to Democracy Now! Why are you at the Climate Summit? We usually talk to you about just overall the costs of war. Thanks, Amy. I'm here because the, uh, there are several universities in the U.K. which have launched an initiative to try to include military emissions more fully in the individual countries' declarations of their emissions. Every year, um, every country that's in Annex 1, that is the parties to the treaty from Kyoto, have to put uh, some of their military emissions in their national inventories. But it's not a full accounting, and that's what we'd like to see. And Nita Crawford, could you talk about the, the uh, what is not being uh, registered or monitored in terms of the military? It's not just uh, the fuel that powers the jets of an air force or uh, or, or that uh, that powers ships as well. Could, uh, given the hundreds and hundreds of military bases that the United States has around the world, what are some of the uh, the aspects of the carbon footprint of the U.S. military that people are not paying attention to? Okay, I think there's three things to keep in mind here. First, there are emissions from installations. The United States has about 750 military installations abroad, overseas, and it has about uh, 400 in the U.S. And most of those installations uh, ab abroad, we don't know what their emissions are. And that is because of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol decision to exclude those emissions or have them count for the country that the bases are located in. So the other thing that we don't know is uh, a, a large portion of emissions from operations. So at Kyoto, the decision was taken not to include operations from war, 
that was sanctioned by the United Nations or other multilateral operations. So those emissions are not included. And there's also something known as uh, called bunker fuels, which are the the fuels used on planes and aircraft. Uh, I'm sorry, aircraft and uh, ships in international waters. Most of the uh, United States Navy's operations are in international waters, so we don't know those emissions. Those are excluded. Now, the reason for that was in uh, 1997, the DOD sent a memo to the White House saying that if emissions were included, then the U.S. military might have to reduce its operations. And they, they said in their memo, a 10 percent reduction in emissions would lead to a lack of readiness. And that lack of readiness would mean that the United States would not be prepared to do two things. One is uh, be militarily superior and wage war any t time, anywhere. And then secondly, not be able to respond to what they saw as the climate crisis that we would face. And, and why were they so aware in 1997? Because they'd been studying the climate crisis since the 1950s and 1960s, and they were aware of the effects of greenhouse gases. So th that's what's included and what's excluded. And there's another large category of, of emissions we don't know about, which is uh, any emission coming out of the military industrial complex. All of the uh, equipment that we use has to be produced somewhere. Much of it comes from large military industrial corporations in the United States. Some of the, those corporations acknowledge their what are known as direct and uh, somewhat indirect emissions, but we don't know the entire supply chain. So I have an estimate uh, that the, the top um, military industrial um, companies have emitted about the same amount of fossil fuel emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, as the military itself in any one year. So really, when we think about the entire carbon footprint of the United States military, it has to be uh, said that we're not counting all of it. And in addition, we're not counting Department of Homeland Security emissions. I haven't counted them yet, and those should be included as well. I wanted and to... Go ahead, Juan. Could you talk about uh, burn pits as well? Uh, the the U.S. military must be unique in the world the, that wherever it goes, it always ends up destroying stuff on the way out, whether it's a war or or, or an occupation. Uh, could you talk about burn pits as well? I, I don't know as much about burn pits, but I, I do know some, something of the history of the environmental destruction that any military makes from the colonial era to the uh, Civil War, when the, the uh, Civil War log structures were, were made from uh, entire forests cut down or roads were made from trees, the United States military has been a mechanism of environmental destruction. Uh, in the, uh, in the, war, the Revolutionary War and in the Civil War and, and obviously in uh, Vietnam and Korea, the United States has uh, taken out areas, jungles or forests, where they thought that insurgents would hide. So the, the burn pits are just part of a larger sort of um, uh, disregard for the atmosphere and the environment, the toxic environment. And even the chemicals left at uh, bases that are leaking from containers for fuel are toxic. So there's a, as, as both of the other speakers have said, there's a larger environmental damage footprint that we need to think about. Finally, uh, in 1997, a group of neoconservatives, including the future vice president, then Halliburton CEO, uh, Dick Cheney, argued in favor of exempting all military emissions from the Kyoto Protocol. In the letter, Cheney, along with Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, former Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger, wrote, by exempting only U.S. military exercises that are multinational or humanitarian, unilateral military actions, as in Grenada, Panama and Libya, will be become politically and diplomatically more difficult. Eric Edstrom, your response. I think, it, indeed, it absolutely will be more difficult. And um, I think it is our duty as engaged citizens to apply pressure on our government to take this existential threat seriously. And if our government fails to step up, we need to be electing new leaders who are going to do the right thing that will change uh, the tides and will actually 
uh, put forth the effort that is required here, because truly uh, the world depends on it. Well, we're going to end it there, but, of course, continue to follow this issue. Eric Edstrom is an Afghan war vet, a graduate of West Point. He studied climate at Oxford. And his book is Un-American, A Soldier's Reckoning of Our Longest War. Uh, Ramon Mejia is inside the COP, anti-militarism national organizer with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. He is an Iraq war vet. Um, he has been participating in protests inside and outside the COP in Glasgow. And also with us, Anita Crawford, Costs of War Project at Brown University. She's a professor of political science at Boston University. When we come back, we go to Stella Morris. Uh, she's the partner of Julian Assange. So what's she doing at Glasgow as she talks about the ex how WikiLeaks exposed the hypocrisy of wealthy nations in addressing the climate crisis? And why isn't she and Julian Julian Assange, why aren't they able to marry? Is the uh, Belmarsh prison authorities, is Britain saying no? Stay with us. Good night, everything, by liars. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're broadcasting from New York, New Jersey, and Glasgow. This is Climate Countdown. Britain's high court's expected to decide in the coming weeks whether to extradite WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States, where he faces up to 175 years in prison in the U.S. under the Espionage Act for publishing classified documents exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. Julian has been jailed in England for two and a half years. Before that, he spent over seven years holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he'd been granted political asylum. We're now joined by Julian's partner, Stella Morris. She's traveled to Glasgow as part of her campaign to free Julian Assange, as well as to highlight how WikiLeaks has revealed evidence of how corporations and states have undermined the goals of prior climate summits. Uh, Stella uh, spoke on Monday at the People's Summit in Glasgow, which is organized by the COP26 coalition. Stella Morris, welcome to Democracy Now! Um, it's great to have you with us. So, talk about why why you have come to Glasgow. Uh, what is your message? Hi, Amy. I'm here because I'm here to rally support for Julian and also to raise awareness of the extraordinary, of the extraordinary wealth of information that WikiLeaks has pu published about the climate um, over the years and the archive of WikiLeaks just becomes more and more re relevant for every year that passes. There are thousands and thousands of emails and documents um, that document not only, um, for example, how uh, the melting ice cap sparked a scramble for the Arctic, like the scramble for Africa for Arctic oil and minerals, um, but also, for example, about how uh, the shell had infiltrated um, the Nigerian government and the uh, Shell executive vice president boasted to the U.S. embassy uh, that they had seconded people into every relevant ministry of the Nigerian government and that the Nigerian government wasn't aware that Shell knew exactly what was going on and which decisions were being taken and, and uh, shaping how those decisions were being taken. 
so really the, the WikiLeaks archive is quite an extraordinary uh, tool uh, for activists, for a uh, academics, um, for people working in this area to be able to um, understand the relationship between the states and the fossil fuel companies how those uh, interests are intertwined, the fact that there is no bright line between many of these states and the fossil fuel industry, and that, in fact, there's a revolving door, um, and that uh, the goals of the summit uh, are frustrated by this reality. And so could you talk about back in uh, the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit COP15, uh, Julian's revelations how the U.S. government was seeking dirt on nations that were opposing uh, its uh, uh, its uh, policies and views on how to deal with climate change. Could you remind our audience about some of the revelations back then? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Julian was actually in Copenhagen uh, for the COP 2015. And he, WikiLeaks published the draft uh, negotiation, the draft uh, document, and it was revealed through WikiLeaks uh, cables uh, that the uh, U.S. was spying on delegates, uh, finding dirt on um, delegates and, and basically bribing countries into watering down uh, their positions, um, which defeated the, the purpose of, of the of the climate talks and really in order to actually achieve meaningful change you need buy-in from these governments and these governments are often compromised and so WikiLeaks allows uh, uh, understanding of how that compromise takes place um, and how these inter uh, interests are um, defeating the purpose of these summits. I think uh, at the COP in Copenhagen. It's the first time we came in contact with Julian. Um, and then, of course, interviewed him a number of times afterwards. And people can go to democracynow.org uh, for those interviews inside the Ecuadorian embassy, outside at a public event, and then um, uh, also speaking to him uh, from here inside the embassy. Um, Stella, if you can talk about how you think these revelations are playing into the uh, demand by the U.S. for uh, Julian to be extradited to the United States and explain the latest with his case, the U.S. saying that if he is tried in the United States, that he could be imprisoned in Australia? Well, look, um, these revelations that I was just talking about are part of the publications that Julian is indicted over. He faces 175 years for publishing the truth, for making this information that um, is indisputably in the public interest, uh, available to the public. And uh, the U.S. government uh, under Trump took the unprecedented step to criminalize journalism, uh, to criminalize receiving information from a journalistic source and publishing that to the public. And so this is an extraordinary uh, um, overstep by the Trump administration that the Biden administration is still going along with, incredibly. Uh, so Julian is uh, had his... Sorry, the U.S. lost uh, the case in January and appealed that case two days before Trump left office. The Trump administration lodged its appeal under Bill Barr, and uh, the appeal was heard on the 27th and 28th of October. Um, but there have been some major developments since the summer, and we were able to introduce a bombshell story uh, that came out in late September about how the CIA under Mike Pompeo had plotted to assassinate, kidnap and rendition Julian uh, from the embassy. And uh, the UK courts now stand uh, confronted with the fact that can they really extradite Julian to the country that plotted to kill him? And, and what are the next steps for those who have not been following his case in our audience? Uh, what are the what are the next steps in the in the court proceed, uh, proceedings uh, uh, in the UK? Well, Julian was arrested on the 11th of April uh, 2019 after this extraordinary campaign that the CIA had uh, rolled out from the moment, basically, that Pompeo came into office. Uh, WikiLeaks published. Uh, Vault 7, 
which was a, the biggest um, CIA leak in history. And the CIA uh, then plotted out how to take revenge on Julian, partly to, um, for example, it plotted to assassinate him and to kidnap him, but also to roll out a PR campaign and planted false information, false stories in the media to create a... Um, climate that would allow for his arrest. And he was ultimately arrested on the 11th of April 2019 after a barrage of, of uh, false uh, stories had been published for almost a year. And um, he's been in Belmarsh prison ever since for over two and a half years while this uh, written, outrageous case goes through the, the UK courts. Um, and the UK opposed his getting bail in January, and so he remains in prison, unconvicted, on remand. We expect a decision later this uh, year, before, the, before Christmas, uh, most likely, uh, and it could be within weeks. Let me ask you about more of the connection between the climate and war released by the WikiLeaks documents. Um, you have a top U.S. diplomat um, as early as June 2006, writing a succinct yet detailed report or diplomatic cable revealing the extent to which the water supply and surrounding environment in Basra, Iraq, had been heavily contaminated by oil, toxic and radioactive materials. Um, if you could talk about that and uh, how it, you know, the Iraq war logs, the Afghan uh, logs, these are military logs that are released. These aren't exposing, you know, peace act writing about what they think is happening. It's documenting what's happening on the ground. That's right. Um, the WikiLeaks has published, um, you know, it, it's not just the cables. WikiLeaks has published since uh, 2006, since its, its inception, uh, many, many millions of documents, uh, original uh, documents, uh, including the uh, report about Balad uh, Air Base uh, burn pits, which was um, releasing uh, toxic gas uh, into, into the air base and basically um, harming U.S. soldiers and Iraqi, uh, Iraqis alike. And WikiLeaks has published uh, many uh, examples uh, and studies about the impact of um, armed conflict on the environment. And another aspect which WikiLeaks has shed light on is how uh, the U.S., um, how corporations have been spying on activists. Um, and with the explosion of the private uh, intelligence industry and the extraordinary resources that the fossil fuel industry has in which it um, uh, is able to hire these private spy, spy companies. They're able to spy on journalists and activists. We've seen Pegasus as an example about how this happens. We did... Um... In, Stella, in, in February 2016, uh, WikiLeaks published uh, a trove of documents that exposed uh, serious corruption and environmental degradation in the Central African Republic. Uh, from uh, multinational corporations that were uh, involved in the extracting minerals there. Could you talk about that and the impact that that had? Well, I'm not particularly familiar with that uh, publication. Uh, I know that BP, for example, uh, covered up a massive blowout in Azerbaijan um, just months before the uh, Deepwater Horizon uh, catastrophic disaster in the Mexican Gulf. Uh, so there's, there's a, an enormous wealth of, uh, of information, of documents about every single country um, and about these climate negotiations from the inside, how the U.S. was manipulating uh, and bribing smaller countries, spying on delegates and so on. Um, and I, you know, I, I encourage everyone who's involved and who's interested in uh, our climate to go to the WikiLeaks archive and search, search for their um, specific uh, companies. Um, there are thousands and tens of thousands of references to the major oil companies and, um, and to also by uh, searchable by, by country and so on. 
Stella Morris, on Sunday you tweeted, Julian and I are trying to get married. But what should be a straightforward process and a sacred right is being illegally interfered with by sinister elements of the state. Blocking us from exercising our basic right to a family life is harassment. It's illegal and it's wrong, you wrote. Can you explain, um, you're also an attorney, how and why you've been prevented from getting married to Julian? You're also the mother of uh, two of your and Julian's children. Well, it's a good question. Why is uh, the UK standing in the way of our getting married? Uh, this is, you know, our decision. Um, it's no one else's business but ours. Uh, and even this little thing is being interfered with. I uh, approached the prison in May asking what steps I had to take. I got an initial response, but nothing after that. And then um, Julian put in a formal request in uh, a month ago to the prison, asking for the prison to governor to authorize Belmarsh as a venue for the marriage, and received no response. Uh, we booked uh, the uh, council uh, registrar to come in to, to receive our notice that we were getting married, and uh, the prison didn't give us any response until just the afternoon before the registrar was due to come in, saying that they had referred the matter to the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, the Crown Prosecution Service represents the United States in the extradition case. So, um, essentially, the U.S. is being given a veto in relation to whether we can get married. This is completely outrageous, and so we're suing the U.K. government. And how is Julian um, emotionally, psychologically? You're one of the few people who gets to see him. Um, can you talk about what those meetings are like, where you meet him in this maximum security prison at Belmarsh? Well, we meet in a really big uh, visitor's hall uh, where the other prisoners are also meeting their family. At the moment, it's only immediate family who can see him. I see him um, regularly, um, uh, every week, and he's, you know, he's really struggling. He's extremely thin, uh, and it's really taking a toll on him, and every day is a struggle. You can just imagine. There's no end in sight. Uh, th this can go on for years, potentially, or it could also finish quickly, and he could be extradited to the U.S. before the summer. So there's such uncertainty, and it is so outrageous that he is not free. The judge cited suicide possibility. I hate to ask you that question. Well, the reason the UK um, blocked this extradition is under grounds of oppression, so it would be oppressive to extradite him. Extraditing him would be tantamount to sending to him, him to his death, and that's because they're driving him um, to take his life because he has endured what no person has had, uh, should have to endure. And uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture has said that he is being psychologically tortured. His physical health is seriously deteriorated. And they are killing him. If he dies, it's because they are killing him. They are torturing him to death. Stella Morris, I want to thank you so much for being with us, the partner of the imprisoned WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, in Glasgow, as part of her campaign to free Julian and to show how WikiLeaks revealed evidence of corporations and states undermining the goals of prior climate summits. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.